Purdy. Yes, Hickok 45, your internet shooting companion, coming to you from the green, beautiful green hills of Tennessee. Yes, the home of a lot of Paul Harrell fans. Yes, give them a shout out. We miss Paul Harrell on the tube, don't we? So, glad you're here, and I'm glad I'm here. I'm glad my 4570 is out here as well with me and here like you and me. So this is the old uh, classic one made in 1886, a model 1886, made in 1886. Look at those scars on it. Yeah, character scars, if you can see those. That's a beauty, isn't it? Came out of Alaska, at least part of its life, as I understand. Bought it in Las Vegas. No, not in a gambling casino. Uh, yeah, one of the dancing girls had it and saw it. Uh, no, it was at the uh, Antique Arms Show in Las Vegas. One of the best, maybe the best in the country, in the world, possibly, right? You know, if you're talking about a gun show, uh, like, like Tulsa, the biggest gun show in America, uh, which kind of means it's maybe the biggest gun show in the world, yeah. I don't know. I mean, there may be, what am I not thinking of? What do I not know of? What am I ignorant about? Lots of things, probably. But I don't think there are a lot of countries on the planet, planet Earth, that have lots of big gun shows and a very active firearms market. Uh, at least a legal one, I don't know. <laughs> Although I understand Afghanistan, there's a lot of guns you can buy uh, pretty easily. You know, get you an AK in the the markets you know around town at least it used to be that way so anyway yeah, here i am rambling already but uh again this is a rambling video it's a sunday video glad you're here a little different video it's a sunday video and uh don't forget the hickok 45 clips channel a couple comments on videos over there today don't forget well, the first thing uh the uh last week i wasn't 100 percent sure although i put it in the comments and in the description, I think, the exact times on the meet and greets at the NRA exhibit, you know, meet and greets in Dallas uh, in May. And that is uh, on the 18th on Saturday at 11 o'clock to 12 o'clock at the Silencer Central booth, okay? And then uh, from 2 to 3 at the SDI, the Sonoran Desert Institute booth, okay? Both great supporters of the channel. Silencer Central and Sonoran Desert Institute will be at their booths uh, on that Saturday. So I'll put that in descriptions or in, yeah, over the next few weeks and everything. Now, uh, so yeah, here I am, uh, number 227. Wow, you know, last week someone asked, why, they said it'd been a great time to have the P2, a uh, SIG P226 out. I thought of that when it was 226, but I don't have a uh, SIG P226, <laughs> so I didn't, you know, uh, so that wasn't an option if I had even wanted to, okay? But this is a jewel. Uh, yeah, uh, I, I want to try to make that show. Didn't go to SHOT Show last year. One reason I'm motivated to go to SHOT Show occasionally, don't really need to be there. It's just kind of a perk, kind of interesting to go see everything in the firearms industry has come along and all that. But I actually enjoy the uh, antique arms show that's usually held that same week, uh, right across the way. You know, it was at the Westgate Hotel, you know. But uh, 
Yeah, that's that's always. I'm looking forward to that. It's usually it seems like it's the uh, weekend. Uh, the Friday starts on Thursday or Friday as Shot Show's wrapping up, and I'm looking forward to that more than Shot Show, generally speaking. So, anyway, that's where I picked this up. I guess that was I should have looked it up. It's uh, it was pre-COVID, I think. It was yeah, yeah, it was, and probably I don't know, 2019 maybe. Uh. Yeah, probably 19. Might have been 20, which you know was just as it was hitting. Uh, 2020. Uh, I think that year, Shot Show was. It's normally end of January. I think it was like the first part of February or something. But uh, no one knew about the dreaded pandemic until we got back home. Right? That might have been when I got it. I don't know. So it uh, it's a beauty. 1886. I have said many times this is probably the ultimate, the premier lever gun of all time. You know, th there's no other lever gun. Uh, for me, and for a lot of people, that matches the 1886 quite. Now, there's some really close. And it may not be your most, if you only have one, might not be it because it's heavy, it's, it's large. But just a beauty. I mean, you can. The Henry, of course, is wonderful. The 1892s are you know, fabulous, and others, the Marlins. The 1886 is a, it's just a big old guy, and it uh, feeds like butter and uh, shoots a big bullet. This one happens to shoot 4570, and uh, that's pretty pretty cool. I'm gonna try some. I got some. I got some Steinle trapdoor safe ammo. Uh, this is an 1886, even though it's, uh, it was made in 18, the 1880s, 1886, um, the, the model 1886 is famous for being very, very strong, and uh, I don't, you know, you don't want to shoot uh, barn burners in it, you know, lever evolution or whatever, you know, that kind of stuff, uh, really, really hot stuff, I don't know, it might handle it. Uh, just ready to shake them. Sorry, I have Marlins. I can fire that stuff in. I've got the uh, remake of this gun made by Browning. Uh, you know, you've seen it several times, and uh, you know it's modern. You know, made in, in 1986, and it will handle just about anything. You know, within reason. So if I want to shoot hotter stuff out of a lever gun, I can shoot that, or one of my single shots, or something. My sharps. So. <laughs> So let's try some of the Steinle, Steinle ammo. Yeah, appreciate Wideners.com for the ammo support, got a variety, and uh, Steinle for sending this along. Uh, check out any description as I record today and uh, and get your Hickok 45 discount. All right, oh, this thing loads like butter. Let me show you one going in, okay? You know, on some lever guns, you just pinch yourself and you know, you gotta, Put so much pressure to to get the loading gate down, get the round in, and all that. This one is, is is simple, and really, I think every 1886, even even the uh, remakes. Uh, we did a Kiapa. What else have we done? I think they're all pretty much like that, aren't they? I don't remember. I might be forgetting one uh, that we have done in a reproduction model that wasn't quite as smooth. I don't know, but my Browning is, and these things are. And I really didn't think I would ever have an original of, of one of these. I really like my 1886 Browning uh, when they came out with that as a since the hundredth year anniversary of this gun because they came out with it in 1986. Get it? And that's the year I bought one. Uh, sight unseen. I love hex or octagonal barrels and 4570s and big lever guns. And I just ordered it and I always liked that. So I've had that a long time, 1986. And uh, first year I lived here in this place. And I was yes, perfectly happy. I, I you know, see these things at shows all the time and thought, eh, five, six, 10, 000, 15, you know, and I, I don't know, I, what kind of ammo can I shoot in it? And am I gonna pay that much for one of these things? I've got this other one. I don't have to be concerned as much about that. It it's, wasn't made in the black powder era. And, uh, you know, it wasn't so expensive, all that kind of thing. But I really did, uh, got a good deal on this. 
John found it, the show, he said, hey, Dad, what about this one? You know, uh, and it wasn't, you know, probably, because it's kind of beat up a little bit and everything. Uh, so it was uh, very reasonable, very reasonable. And, uh, and it's in 4570. If something's chambered an old gun in 4570, it just, it, it adds to the price, it just does. Because 4570 is such a desirable round and it's still a common round, it's still a popular round and all that kind of thing. Okay, well, some of the other chamberings, you, know, you go back into the 1800s and some really nice cartridges and guns. You can still get most ammo somewhere, Buffalo Arms or somewhere, load it yourself. You can get about anything. Uh, it might be kind of pricey, but you can get it, and a lot of it even in black powder. Uh, but, you know, 4570, man, you can find that anywhere, can't you? Uh, except Target and Walmart and uh, Walgreens. <laughs> All right, let's shoot some more. Okay, also appreciate Alabama Holster, a uh, great little maker of Kydex holsters for concealment mostly, but not always. Wonderful company, wonderful holsters. I always have one on me. You should too. <laughs> you should be armed wherever you are, right? Even if you are uh, living in Mother Russia or somewhere. Bowling pin. All right. What was this? Steinel. That's right. Steinel ammo. I don't know if I should shoot uh, Clyde with this or not. Uh, I'll put one on him. <laughs> All right. About the dog. All right. Yo, shoot. My heart almost skipped a beat. I thought it wasn't recording. Okay. You wish. How about you, hog? Oh, yeah. That's a, that's a hog round, 4570. Let's appropriately shoot that coffin down there. <laughs> oh yeah. I wonder who fired this thing first, the first rounds in 1886. If he knew I'd be firing it in 2024. If he uh, had any notion some goofball would have this and be talking to a camera to people all over the planet, you know, uh, on YouTube about his gun. He should never have let it go, and that might not have happened. But it is weird to think about it, isn't it? Uh, you take a grizz with it, especially if it was from Alaska, and uh, how many people have owned it over the years. 1886, that's a couple of years, that's at least 30, 40 years, right? It's been around. And man, does it have the, the character mark? It doesn't show abuse. It just shows yeah, decade after decade after decade of little marks here and there. And that's just natural. It's gonna happen, gonna happen. Looks a little bit like maybe, uh, I don't know if those are notches, maybe, I don't know, it's hard to tell. Maybe somebody put a notch in there for every grizz he shot with it. Oh man, or outlaw. Maybe some lawman carried this, or some outlaw. You never know, you never know. Oh, anyway, yeah, speaking of some of the, uh, the videos on, uh, on the Clips channel, uh, what was it? Uh, well, first of all, in the AK, you know, last week I had uh, the SGL 20 out, and I mentioned uh, one of the thoughts that left me was, uh, I was going to make a point about the milled AK. You know, the last AK I chose in that video was the uh, SAM-7, and it has a milled receiver. For those who know AKs and know what I'm talking about, most of you, a lot of you. Uh, I was going to make the point that I, I didn't choose that one because it's milled, you know. And uh, a lot of people are under that impression that of, of AKs of the world, whether it's Russian or Chinese or whatever, Romanian, that uh, the better AK, it's, it's just automatically like a way much better AK if it has a milled receiver. That's not necessarily the truth. It doesn't hurt, and you got a little more weight and maybe rigidity strength. I, I don't know. It's, the, the thing is, it's not, it's not really needed. Okay, it's not really needed for the purposes of that, that AK. In fact, it was designed around having a stamped receiver. That's the way. Kalashnikov, Kalashnikov uh, designed it. 
and uh, I think the very first one, yeah, the very first ones, if I can remember my history of the AK, were stamped receivers. That's that's what it was. And that was the AK. But uh, the, the the Russian stamped receivers, they they were having trouble. The rivets and doing it doing it correctly, they were just having a lot of trouble doing it the way it needed to be done, and being uh, done properly and uh, in a durable fashion, and all that kind of thing. And they finally just you know, I don't know. We 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 can't do this right now. We we need to. We just we we know how to just mill out steel, even though it takes a long time and maybe it's more expensive or whatever. But we know how to do that because that's the way most guns had been made, you know, historically. And so they just went to blocks of steel and milling out receivers, you know. And then as they were doing that, though, they they figured out how to to do the stampings correctly and do it efficiently and have the machinery to do it and. Uh, so years later, whatever it was, they uh, they started stamping them out, or the AKMs, whatever, and they, you know, and that's, that's kind of the AK. Uh, so it, it doesn't have to have a milled receiver. Uh, now it does feel a little more solid as you shoot, a little less recoil and all that kind of thing and, and all that, but it's not, not necessary. Uh, it's not like, so in other words, uh, I, I really might have chosen the one I had out last week as the last AK I'd ever sell. You know, the milled receiver is not the uh, determining factor. That really nice swap folding stock is, is more of a factor because it gives me the same length and feel as the SGL20 that I had last week. And, and I've got a stock that folds and you know, it's things like that maybe, but I, either one of them's fine. It's hard to, I mean, that, that was a point I was gonna make. Also, I've been getting questions about the uh, uh, bill passed in Tennessee about teachers it being legal for teachers to be armed and all that and of course the uh, <laughs> the crazy loony left is having a fit has been having a fit over that uh, it's only teachers that want it and teachers that I don't know all the specifics of the bill actually I haven't followed it as much as some of you all probably but it is, as this comes around every state and different jurisdictions or counties and people that that have that uh, capability it's it's almost always uh it's only with proper training uh pretty extensive training uh and teachers who want to volunteer and go through the training and then all whatever other restrictions there are involved with that and how the firearm is carried you know they go through all that kind of thing the safety issues of course are paramount and everything else but uh, so obviously, what do you think I think about it? I talked about that often, how crazy it was. Uh, there were two people, in fact, with more than two, but there were definitely two where I taught for a long time. Uh, the, the, the other fellow uh, was in the other building that had been perfect because uh, he was very proficient with firearms. He even written some books on the frontier world and everything. And uh, I don't know if he wants me talking about him, but uh, he's very proficient with firearms. He had come out and shot with me uh, once. and. And uh, he was in the other building. I'm in the other main building. And if both of us had had the wherewithal and had the had a firearm, because uh, we were both semi-sensible and would have been able to do that properly and everything, that school would have been safer, as far as I'm concerned, much safer. I would have been safer. <laughs> the kids would have been safer. Now, we didn't have any issues. Nothing ever happened like that. But but you don't know when that's going to happen. It's, it's rarely rare. It's like a plane dropping out of the sky. But when it does, it's really bad, you know. I, I mean, I did at one time, I was on the corner and there was a, a very shady looking character that came walking onto campus from this highway, came trudging up like he had some purpose, you know. And, and uh, I just happened to be walking over there and uh, as I was talking to the kids, teaching boredom with something, and I said, ah, oh, somebody's coming on campus, you know. And I, and uh, he kept on moving. He was coming up along the side of and I said, let me, uh, y'all work on this, whatever. And I went next door real quick and told my colleague next door to, uh, said, would you kind of watch this? Uh, there's somebody coming up onto campus here. And I just went down the steps right outside the door and I down there and, and intercepted them as they got up almost into the, another entry into the library and different areas. And they didn't really want to leave. And I couldn't tell whether the person was insane or on something or what it was, he, but he, he, was, he was looking for something up here, like he knew somebody, he was like kind of making up story. Anyway, uh, we got him turned around the other direction. Probably nothing, but you just never know. You just never know. 
course I was armed. Yeah, with 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 a pen, right? <laughs> But anyway, if something had happened or does happen, and you have some people who are designated and they know what they're doing, uh, you know, if I had young kids in a school somewhere, I'd sure wish that uh, there were some teachers armed because I would assume they would be the ones who volunteered for it, obviously, and are trained, and maybe they could save some lives if something happened like that. So, uh, everybody has these visions of you know, I mean, teachers generally have a lot of responsibility. You know, there's kids, there's nothing. I've had a lot of different kinds of jobs, but man, that was, that was one with the utmost responsibility. I even drove a bus sometimes with them in the afternoons, a whole you know, 20 or even 50 of them, like to a, a, a field day or something. And, and you know, I mean, you talk about responsibility and then just be it all day long. You're responsible for people's most valuable possession, what you want to call it, their kids, you know. Uh, so, you know, uh, anybody that volunteers to to uh, to go through that training, they're going to they're gonna be somebody that is probably halfway sensible, you know. So anyway, yeah, I'm all for that, of course. Oh, yeah, there was someone, the usual stupid stuff comes out. It's just like when the carry uh, permits were moving from state to state and all the same tired argument oh it'll be like dodge city you know on the streets and all that kind of thing and one of the administrators at one of the is, is in nashville i think or knoxville what did he say uh let's see, let's see, let's see. several superintendents have said they don't need they don't need or want more guns <laughs> how dumb is that because here i am saying teachers actually are responsible but they're not all that smart right i mean look at me exhibit a uh, we don't need or want more guns. Oh boy, what a br how that is one of the dumbest things I've ever heard. I I'll bet you if there was a shooter that came onto your campus, uh, you'd probably call the police. You might dial 911, or maybe you wouldn't. You don't need more guns on campus. I don't want any more guns coming to campus. No, don't want any guns, more guns. So, the shooters have got a gun or two, that's enough. We don't want more guns. We don't need more guns. Oh, man. So anyway, <laughs> I, yeah, I'm all, I'm all for that. I, you know, I tell you, I, I have a slightly different stance on some of that. You know, that used to be, I think it was after one of the, the movie theater shooting, the one in, was Aurora, Colorado? I'm not sure where that is, but, you know, and, and some of these arguments start coming up about some of that. And so, about being armed it should be okay to have a fire i think it's illegal to have a firearm in that theater maybe or something didn't seem to work uh and you'd see people just right and left some people that are reasonably sensible normally they would just i don't want to shoot out i'm in the theater and people shooting me by mistake and i don't want everybody to have a gun in there and you know i get shot by the guy sitting behind me or some uh somebody with a gun doesn't know what they're doing to me, that's extra dumb as well. Because if someone comes in there to actually start mowing people down, like happened, I don't care. Some, I need relief. If I don't have a firearm, I don't care if the, the little old lady behind me is not very proficient with a firearm. I, I want somebody shooting back at him. You know, he's more likely to take off running. He's not ready for that. I, you know, I mean, what's the difference? He gets shot by her or by him. At least she's trying to shoot the bad guy. <laughs> I, I know, it's just, it brings out the uh, idiocy and the ignorance in, uh, in people. Firearms really do. Well, a lot of things do, but uh, it, it's funny. And, and you know, if you have an area, there was another comment on the, one of the clips video. I think it was one where I, yeah, I talked about how the, can you believe the news media? John pulled that out from the video. And I saw a lot of interesting comments there. And, some people talking about how they'd had experience with the media and and how they literally don't get things right at all very often on anything you know because they were they were there maybe at some incident they actually witnessed or whatever it was and and i've had some of that in my own life when i played basketball you, know, you get interviewed after a ball game especially in college or whatever and it, it, it'd say things that you said that you didn't say uh and then of course with the youtube thing over the years, you know, things that show up, interviews or, 
or just people say things that you know you, you just didn't say or you didn't do or you, you say so you realize when any time someone else is talking about you or an event uh, it's very likely not to be correct yeah imagine that <laughs> this is the one gun I brought out other than the one I have in my Alabama holster in my pocket uh, I thought this was enough I wanted to shoot this baby and load him up again so what's been going on with you all huh uh, hope you've been having some better weather like we have and that where you live it's green I was uh, looking at last week's Sunday video a little bit little, as little as possible you know of course I hate to see myself but I was looking at the background and it was just beautiful you know the, the green the yellow green the, the leaves uh, yeah green green beats uh, so, uh, winter <laughs> beats the gray doesn't it it really does. Ticks and all, I'll take them. I'll take them. I'll fight them. Uh, I mean, there are advantages to you know the winter when everything has died down. You don't. There are no bugs. There are no ticks or anything like that. You can go anywhere you want out in the woods, and they're just not as pretty, not as desirable. Forty-five seventy. Oh man. Yeah, I am the curator of this baby. Okay. Let's put another one on that target. See if I can hit it. Oh, Chloe. <laughs> Got off before I met. Yeah. Try that uh, buffalo hanging up there. Yeah, I missed him earlier. I was holding too low. Got that gong. See if I'm holding too low on him. Was almost holding too far left. I would not have been surprised if I had missed him. Yeah, these big old actions. Yeah, this is uh, this is the kind of thing that uh, when I talk about regretting people who are gun haters. They think every gun is a rattlesnake, don't ever want to be around one, that kind of thing. They, they've really, they, they miss out on such a huge piece of Americana history. Uh, if you don't like guns, you don't like them, you know, I guess. But uh, yeah, it's just, uh, wow. Hundreds of years of history of, uh, of you know, specific firearms that, that you can still actually fire and enjoy. And it's just uh, kind of phenomenal that uh, it's just not a lot of pieces of machinery that last through the ages like a firearm does, right? How many cars do you do you uh, see on the road that were made, you know, like an 1810, 1850, huh? Answer me that one. <laughs> so uh, pretty cool. And 4570, if you are new to guns, which is not all that likely here today but you know this is a big old 4570 cartridge 405 grain bullet big old case you know I have big hands so that's a pretty big case cartridge even in my hand uh, pretty nice the Steinel same thing big old flat nose those are 405 grain bullets I believe yes 405 grains and I've got some uh, I got a lot of cool 4570 ammo. I do. Uh, got uh, all kinds of brand Black Hills. I've got some uh, uh, Underwood ammo, and if you've seen some of that, extreme penetrators and all that kind of thing. I got shooting this gun, maybe. So, anyway, pretty cool. Uh, oh yeah, there was a. It reminded me of something. What did it remind me of? Oh yeah, the motorcycle. Uh, John, one of the things John Clips John posted over on the uh, Haycock 45 Clips channel was about me selling my motorcycle. <laughs> the same old deal. People, oh, you sold your motorcycle? Oh, like I sold it yesterday. Uh, well, I, I, that's been, what, four or five years ago I sold that. <laughs> so follow the link to the original video uh, and you can see how old the video is. But uh, I sold that and it was funny there were so many people talking about yeah I got old too and all these different things or get you a smaller motorcycle you'll enjoy it or get something beside a Harley and you'll you wouldn't have sold it if you had something besides a Harley and all these the comments are so funny 
uh, I thought I mentioned it in the video, but I just wasn't writing it. It wasn't because I got too old to handle it. It wasn't because uh, it was too big. Um, I, and it wasn't because I got tired. I, a lot of people, a lot of interesting comments. I was in, interested to, to, to see people's uh, experience and their writing life, their history, who've been writing all their lives and talked about how they finally uh, had to give it up to, you know, and different things, or they got injured or had accidents, had seen too many accidents, or had uh, decided to quit writing as well because of all the cell phone usage and cars and various things. And uh, well, my, my case was different, and I, I John kind of got me into it. He bought one, and I rode his a little bit. I thought, this is cool. Somebody, I remember riding a scooter up in Indiana when I was a teenager and everything. I mean, a real scooter, like a Cushman, and you could crank it 60, 70 miles an hour. And I, I remember that being fun, and, and riding his was fun. A little bit, I rode it. And so he gave me the course. Uh, as a birthday present to take the course on riding and get my license and uh, certification wherever you need it. And I did it and then I bought one. And that was probably eight, 10 years ago. And it was fun. It's like anything when it's new. And I, I rode it you know, a fair amount that first six months or so, off and on. And, and uh, but it just gradually dwindled. And I, I was less and less interested. Of course, we're busy doing this, but I, I, so many days I could have gotten on it and ridden it that I didn't, you know, be like, like today, for example, nice day. I, I it just wouldn't even think about it almost. And whereas if you're a hardcore rider, uh, you would have been out riding this morning or whatever. And so what I, what with me, the case was, uh, not that I just got tired or got too old to ride it or too many decades of riding or anything, yeah, over the span of the four years, I realized, and didn't it take all the four years to realize it, that this is cool, but I, 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 you know, I can kind of take it or leave it. And that's that's what the deal was with me. And then again, it was kind of in the way and everything. And, and, and you really do need to keep uh, in practice or keep riding it or not, especially with a big heavy bike like, like the Harley. Uh, or, or maybe not ride at all. If you're going to almost not ride at all, you might be better off not riding at all. You know, and experienced bikers or trainers will tell you that. And so that's where I was. And, and busy doing this, and I said, ah, I'm going to get on this one day. I wasn't afraid, but I'm going to get on this thing one day since I don't ever ride it. And it's going to be my luck. I'll hit a deer or uh, somebody will be texting hit me or I'll just uh, whatever. Cause I mean, they're, they're, they are a little risky. You gotta, I had someone pull out in front of me once that I just about lost it, but I didn't. Uh, uh, so I think, you know, I don't want to spend a year in the hospital healing from a motorcycle accident when it, I'm not even driven to ride them, you know, where it's just because I have it, I get out on occasion. You know, and uh, so that was kind of, it was all that together. Wasn't too old, wasn't afraid. I just wasn't riding it. And, uh, and that's the kind of thing, you know, I don't need to do that. And then I can't do videos or shoot. My, my favorite hobby, shooting. Then I can't, I, I'm jeopard. I was, felt like I might be jeopardizing my shooting hobby uh, for, you know, for some stupid accident that I could possibly have because it's, uh, you know, a deer end up in my lap or something. I, I, I'll just sell this thing. Uh, if, and there were times for a year or two, I'd see someone on one or drive by a motorcycle. So I, yeah, I could go buy one of those again. I could buy one tomorrow. Yeah. Uh, but I, I just not driven enough to do it. You know, it's kind of what I got down to. Okay, so that, that makes sense. Makes sense. So anyway, <laughs> We guys are bad about hobbies anyway. You know, we get into one and out of it and go from one thing to another. And uh, shooting, I've always enjoyed a lot. And other hobbies like that, I've you know, picked up or messed around with a while. But nah, that's okay. It's fun, but I, I could take that or leave it. So that's really what that was. But shooting ain't that way. I enjoy it. I think part of it is in shooting in the, the firearms uh, world, there's so many different types of firearms. If you like shooting, uh, there's so much variety. Yeah. It's kind of like these Sunday videos. I was thinking, what am I in the mood to shoot? And I had a shotgun on my mind, maybe. And uh, I got a shotgun in play. And I don't know, a lever gun would be fun. And uh, 
I had a couple of revolvers in mine, and I ended up with this, you know, so it, it, there's so much variety, you know, 22 rimfire, whatever. I'm almost always in the mood to sling heavy lead, all right, you have to watch me. I think there was a spell what last year wasn't there. I had a 4570 out about three out of four Sundays. And yeah, on the Sharps rifle, uh, it was I was uh, kind of torn between this or the Sharps and 4570. And uh, this one out, it won out. Okay. All right. Hey, let's knock him over. Well, I don't want to fall. <laughs> hmm. Let's see if I can get the small plate if I know where to hold well enough with this thing. All right, pop in. <laughs> yeah, boy. If only I knew who had been carrying this before I got it. You step on this 40, probably the 4570 brass is, uh, if you, it's kind of like 45 ACP, you don't want to step on it. If you can avoid it before you pick it up because it, it'll actually, you know, smash it. It's so big, bend it down. So makes it hard to reload. Oh yeah. Anything else you're dying to know about? Probably not. Uh, again, appreciate everybody that helps us. Talon grips and ballast stall, you know, wideners, SDI, Alabama holsters, Bud, Silencer Central. And uh, I'll be seeing some of you at the Dallas uh, NRA uh, meeting, hopefully. And, uh, yeah. And if, uh, if you've never been to an NRA uh, exhibits, uh, you would probably like it probably like it a lot and I know the NRA kind of thing with the uh, you know in past years is good uh, not only I mean I obviously don't have to be a huge fan of the NRA to go to that I think you have to be a member to get in I don't know they have a deal where you can just pay to go in I, I don't I think you have to join to pay so basically you got to pay the 35 bucks or whatever it is to, to go in to the exhibits I guess uh, but um, it's uh, the attraction it always has been is that virtually every gun maker and everybody's there and as i've said before you, you go into all the booths and you know whether it's uh, the, 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 some years or someone who was it wasn't there last year was it sig or fn i don't know but generally speaking all the makers are there with huge booths and all their guns out and you're allowed to handle them they have all the firing pins out of them and you can actually snap them and work the actions and those kinds of things you really can't do in a gun shop you know you, but uh at that show you can handle like every model they make is probably out there on display and you can pick them up and and work them and look at look them over and it's just you know it's, it's very unique very unique regardless of your uh, you know feelings about the nra and it's one of those deals where since everybody is there uh, um, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's a great place to, to go. So anyway, uh, it'd be good to see you and it won't be that far down the road here, you know, this, this month. So later this month. So yeah, the 18th, that's, that's coming right up. That's just a couple of weeks actually. Yeah. I'll be seeing you in a couple of weeks. Hard to believe. Uh, dread Dallas. I hate to drive in Dallas. That is the craziest city. It is crazy. Once you get downtown, it's okay. Once you get parked, but I hate that. I hate to drive around Dallas. Uh, like the city, but man, mess. All right. Oh, anything about young about old young people that need to know? <laughs> uh, oh, I, yeah. Here's my advice for young people: uh, be careful about things. You have to. You have to think. You have to think about things, and uh, exercise caution sometimes. You know, even when you think you're being careful, driving is the best example, isn't it? When you think you're being careful, uh, you think you're being really careful, uh, something can still happen. I always like to think of uh, everybody who's had an accident today. 
today. And there's been some unfortunate accidents today, I'm sure. People have died, have been hurt badly, will be in a hospital for weeks or months that have had accidents today in this country. And I'll bet you almost every single one of them thought they were being plenty careful. They thought they had looked both ways. They just knew that light was green. And it might have been, but someone else didn't know what color it was coming across that intersection. You know, that's the thing. That's why you don't only have to be careful about uh, certain things, but extra careful. There's never that big a rush to get anywhere or to do anything, to unload a gun quickly or load it too quickly or whatever. Just calm down, be deliberate about things and realize how much risk there actually is in some endeavors. Not that you want to avoid that risk or avoid that endeavor, but exercise caution and it will make that endeavor. Guns is a good example in, in driving. Uh, been doing both all my life. And you know, either one could get me, you know, with one mishap. Uh, but if you exercise extreme caution, you're fully focused, and, and you realize how easily something could happen, then you're more likely to avoid it, right? Life is just risky. You know, climbing ladders and doing everything we do. Uh, I think there was a, on the driver's test, there used to be a question, I don't know if it's still there or not, uh, ask, what's the car on the driver training test, or whatever, which car causes the most accidents? You know, and you're thinking, well, I don't know, Chevrolet, pickup truck, which car is it that causes the most accidents? And the answer is, the one you didn't see, past tense, the one you did not see, is the one that causes the most accidents. And I always remember that uh, when I'm looking both ways. You know, man, I'm careful, I'm paranoid. And I actually uh, had an accident several, five, six, seven years ago, pulled out. I don't pull out in front of people, but I uh, was coming out of a barbershop area in a uh, town where I live, and it was rainy, and uh, the visibility was bad. There's trees and stuff in the way of the road, but it, it was like I had a light in town. The speed limit was 35 kind of thing. I looked both ways a couple of times, you know, and I was ready to pull out and back this way, back this way. And then as I glanced that way for the second or third time, I, I saw a car, but he was up there pretty far, you know? And so I started to ease on out. And then, and then just like instantly I realized, oh, no, wait a minute, he's, he's coming fast. And so I hit the brakes for just a second. That was a mistake I made. And then I thought, oh my gosh. And I was like out in the lane, maybe that far or something. And uh, I thought, oh, and uh, and then and then he hit the brakes and slammed them on, and started sliding and all this stuff and fishtail. And I was like, okay, I'm just gonna sit still and let him avoid me. I'm not gonna make this matter work. Well, he ended up hitting the rear end of me, the the wheel, and all this, and tore up his car and all this kind of thing. And he wasn't hurt, and I wasn't hurt, but but uh, my mistake was I should have gone on, and it, that wouldn't have. I should have just gone on, goosed it, and gotten on out in front of him, I guess. I don't know, unless he had to hit the brakes or his brakes locked up and it was wet. I don't know. It's, it's, it's crazy. It, and he was going, in, as the re police report, excessive speed. So it's partly his fault because he was, he must have been going like 50 or 60 in the 35 mile. And he just come through a light, you know. It should, I don't know how he got to going so fast. Anyway, uh, you know, and I'm really, really careful. And, uh, you know, and that happened. Uh, so it, it can it can get you. It it, it really can. Uh, uh, so just keep that in mind. None of us is bulletproof. Even a genius like myself can make a mistake. Yeah, even a genius can make a mistake. Now I fire a couple more shots before I let you go. And uh, let me give you another look at this thing. And if you, you've seen it, I hope. It's been around. Look what it says on top of that barrel. Can you read that? I'll get to where you can read it, maybe. Uh, wrong way. Can you see that? 4570. Yeah. Okay. The most desirable caliber, maybe, of all time. 4570. Let me shoot a couple more Steinel rounds here before I kick you out of here. All right. So, 
Don't forget, I hope to see you in Dallas. Uh, and, uh, oh, I need another caution for everybody. <laughs> Did you all hear about the, those people? They were interviewed and everything else uh, on the, the news uh, last week. Uh, I think it was a man and his wife and, I don't know, a little girl or boy traveling now they were traveling down somewhere near the bahamas down there and there what they called the the turks and calicos or something airport i'm not familiar with that area that island or that, that part of the down it's kind of south east of the bahamas okay and i'm not familiar with it but in the airport the guy they discovered he'd gotten out of this country without it being discovered so he didn't know he had them but he had a couple of rounds you know loose rounds bullets in his bag where he'd been out shooting or out hunting or something. Didn't have a gun or anything. He's had a couple of rounds like you and I probably do. My gosh. Uh, I went to D.C. one year, uh, helped chaperone some kids, took them through the Capitol and everything, uh, about a week's trip. I cleaned out everything, my vest, my bags, because I knew we were going into the Capitol building. And uh, jackets and... Boy, I made sure I didn't have an empty case or anything. Kind of like going into Illinois or California, you know. But, um, uh, but anyway, he's, I mean, he's still being held, I think. I think, I think his wife and boy, maybe you're back, I don't know, but he's in big trouble and it, uh, it's like uh, unbelievable. It's a freaking bullet. Yeah. It's not like he had a gun, even if he had a gun. It was, and it was an accident, because that happens all the time at airports. You know, since so many people have carry permits, it happened. Now, it used to be uh, you're treated like a terrorist immediately, you know. But since so many people carry guns and it's so common, then obviously just the odds are going to catch up and there's going to be people occasionally that forget, oh, I forgot my gun was in that bag or whatever. So now they may, they're in trouble, I think. I mean, series fine or whatever it is or they may be in jail I, I don't know it's not quite as severe i think as it used to be because it happens all the time to these normal people uh but you really have to be careful of that and uh and this guy you know i don't know i think he said this he hadn't had much help from the state department uh but he's uh he's in big trouble you know for having a couple of freaking bullets you know uh just just bizarre you would think, you would think, uh, anybody, if they want tourists to come from the United States, wherever this is, or anywhere in the United States, if someone tries to get on an airplane, they've got ammo, or they even have a gun in a bag, they're not really trying to check it, or even they're trying to check it. Okay, pull them aside, take them into the little room, call in the FBI if you need to, whatever. And, and give them a serious uh, interrogation, check their background, you know, do a background search. And it shouldn't be that hard to determine pretty quickly, okay, this guy's not a terrorist. He was probably not get, trying to get on this plane with a gun to take the plane. Uh, he's a, a guy, I knew a, a guy who was a hunting guide in Nashville, this happened to uh, decades ago. And he liked to never got out of that. He'd been out west hunting. He had a 44 Magnum, big old Ruger or something in his bag. And he he, he was checking it. And then, as soon as it went off, he just, ah, oh, forgot that they, that was in my bag. I didn't ever take it out. And he, he like just about spent some time in jail over that. He like never got out of that. And he was a successful business guy in Nashville and all that. Had a gun shop. And, but that ought to just require a an interview and it, it just shouldn't take that much time to determine whether this person is just someone who forgot you know or they might have been up to something and now if there's a real gray area and it's uh, this person does say, i don't know this guy's got a shady background even though he says it was an accident may, well, maybe you hold him a little bit longer or the way have us have a stern uh, a serious fine for it that's i'm okay if you want to charge you know, someone that does that, they try to get on a plane with a gun, and it ha it's accidentally, it's, it's obviously obviously an accident. Um, once you determine this is just some normal guy, gal, who's an accident, okay, it's $5,000 fine. Okay, so be it. But don't, don't treat him like a terrorist and put him in jail. 
and you know required 13 lawyers and two years to get over that i mean it's just bizarre just bizarre and this is just having two or three rounds of ammo in his bag Whew. the world's insane I, the, the world just i mean so many people who just have this weird perception of anybody who's into firearms it's just crazy it's crazy they need to get into the real world somewhere you know see what the real world's like okay i'll get off that soapbox and i will let you go did i load this with some more rounds i think i did so let's put one in the chamber take a couple of shots before i run you out of here get you out of tick country before you start picking them up put another one on uh clyde down there <laughs> he may never forgive me for popping him with a 4570 <laughs> it's hard. Hits me kind of hard, yeah. So, 1886, yeah, it's a good day. I always say it's a good day when you can shoot your AK. It's a great day when you can shoot your 1886, especially when it was made in 1886. That was just a bonus. Uh, it was actually made in 1886. Uh, that's kind of like the first year, right? So apparently they got it right from the get-go. <laughs> so I'm going to let you go and appreciate your support. I'll see you hopefully next week. See uh, a lot of you, I uh, hope, at the uh, NRA exhibits at either the Silentra Central booth or the SDI booth. Life is good.